gives me very great pleasure to welcome to the stand Dr. Lewis Jolien West. Thank you, Hannah, for that extraordinary introduction. I think we do have a lot in common. I might even have been followed by lots of cars, vans, and motorcycles, but in Los Angeles, who would notice? In Twelfth Night, there's a character who says, Sweet are the uses of adversity, which, like the toad, ugly and venomous, bears yet a precious jewel in its head. As you know, I had a little bit of adversity uh, here um, during the noon hour, but something very good came out of it. I missed my lunch. <laughs> Uh, the young man that I uh, encountered, uh, I realize, uh, uh, was uh, a bit of a fanatic. But what's a fanatic? It's just somebody who can't change his mind and won't change the subject. <laughs> And I'd like you to know that when we uh, parted ways at the local police department, each of us having conducted a citizen's arrest upon the other, <laughs> what I said to him was, uh, son, when you decide to leave this outfit, come and see me. <laughs> In 1950, I read L. Ron Hubbard's book, Dianetics. The next year, I met Hubbard. And the following spring, I first sprung somebody from his healing cult, which was then called Dianetics. And that was in early 1952. And I never dreamed at the time that I would be following the evolution of this group for the next 40 years. But uh, I've learned a lot. And I'd like to be able to share it all with you. But I can't compress 40 years of uh, information gathering into this short hour. What I'll try to do then is to concentrate on what I have whimsically called the Scientology Wars. And those of you who are interested in uh, the uh, nuts and bolts of what goes on in uh, the psychotherapy that's conducted within uh, Scientology, uh, which uh, can be understood, uh, or a lot of uh, organizational stuff about it that I have picked up along the way, uh, write to me and I'll send you reprints from other, other articles. In 1967, the first edition of the Comprehensive Textbook of Psychiatry by Friedman and Kaplan came out. That's now one of the major standard works. It was one big volume then, it's three big volumes. Now we've learned something about psychiatry, too, in the last 30 years. 
I contributed a lengthy chapter on dissociative reactions. And then for the second edition, in 1975, at the editor's request, I wrote a chapter entitled Transcendental Meditation and Other Non-Professional Psychotherapies. The following passage is from the manuscript, which I wrote and submitted in 1974 for that edition. So you have to understand this is nearly 20 years ago that this was written. And I'm quoting from that ancient document. The extent to which mental illness today is generally thought to represent bona fide disease, despite the arguments of those who declare it to be a myth, may be reflected by the fact that faith healers of this day seem to be concentrating more of their attention on it. In the past, the non-professional healing of mental disorders remained largely in the province of various priesthoods. Madness, defined as demonic infestation, was cast out through the exercise of interpersonal or group transactions that were given religious definitions. Today, some of the most successful non-professional healing and self-improvement programs offer a judicious combination of old-fashioned religious and modern scientific or science fiction formulations. The reasons for this development probably include both the combined power of suggestion derived from the mysteries of science and religion, and the freedom from governmental harassment that churches enjoy in the United States. You have to understand that the rather ponderous tone of this is because it's from a medical textbook. <laughs> not intended for a luncheon talk. <laughs> Continuing the quote, the Church of Scientology began nearly 25 years ago, that was then, as a pseudoscientific healing cult, primarily directed toward psychiatric and psychosomatic disorders. Its founder, a former engineer and science fiction writer, he was a science fiction writer, <laughs> named L. Ron Hubbard, called his system Dianetics. His book by that name was a bestseller in 1950. It described a procedure that seemed to include popular elements of psychoanalysis, tracing all troubles back to infancy, even to the womb, hypnosis, including a Dianetic reverie to get on the time track to the past, cybernetics, obtaining information from a mental file clerk out of memory banks, and catharsis, undamming mental energy by clearing away inhibitory engrams with resultant relief and even, if totally cleared, permanent cure and subsequent full utilization of all personal potentialities. Today, that's 1974, Scientology is growing by leaps and bounds. Branches are to be found in most American cities. Los Angeles alone is said to have 75,000 members, and 5.5 million members were claimed worldwide in 1972. Dianetics was occasionally in trouble with the law because of statutes concerning the practice of medicine. However, Scientology, indistinguishable from Dianetics as a healing enterprise, is now immune from legal interference because Hubbard and his attorneys succeeded in getting it classified as a religion. The official hostility of Scientology toward the medical establishment in general, as exemplified by the American Medical Association, is exceeded only by its open warfare with psychiatry. And I guess that's where I first introduced the idea that there was a war going on. You couldn't expect the shrinks to know it. They usually know what was going on down the street. <laughs> the appeal of Scientology is largely for the less well-educated, but there are many exceptions. Wealthy eccentrics, including some who are established fixtures of the anti-mental health movement, are drawn to it. The Church of Scientology is now a multi-million dollar enterprise growing steadily in power and respectability, and openly using its special brand of non-professional psychotherapy or mental healing without interference beyond the reach of malpractice suits. 
Many other organizations, agencies, and cults offer non-professional mental healing, psychotherapy, and self-improvement to the public today. They are a large and constantly changing group. Some purport to be purely spiritual, mystical, or religious. Others profess to be totally scientific, secular, and rational. Between these extremes is a spectrum of enterprises. Dianetics slash Scientology is only one that partake to various degrees of both mystique and rationale. End of quote. Now, to the best of my recollection, organized harassment of me by Scientology began about that time, after that was published, with picketing, scurrilous leaflets, and defamatory public statements. And I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven double spaced typewritten pages of accounts of my experience as, um, let's say, a target of Scientology's attacks uh, since uh, 1975 or so. I was going to tell you all about these things, but uh, I think you must know pretty much the kind of things they were, ranging from lawsuits to phone taps, patients' records stolen, uh, uh, and, and patients abused and manipulated in attempts to get them to sue psychiatrists. You must understand that I was specially targeted and not only because uh, of my writings or, or lectures on the subject of cults, but also because of my position at UCLA so that anyone in the whole institute or the kind of practice uh, of medicine that went on there was targeted. And rather than to review all that, fascinating to me, I think probably redundant and boring to you, uh, my war stories, you might say, I'd like just to let you know that I consider myself fortunate. I know scores of others whose experiences were much more horrendous than anything that ever happened to me. But for today, I think the question we should ask is how all this came about. Why would the Church of Scientology behave so savagely, even towards such a mild and inoffensive academician as myself? <laughs> Never mind people like Hannah and Jerry, who are renegades, <laughs> deserters. Uh, traitors to the cause. To understand it, I think we have to look at L. Ron Hubbard, the man, in some greater detail. To understand a war, you have to understand something of the psychology of the commander-in-chief, the man who conducts the war. To begin with, one must realize that L. Ron Hubbard was an incredible liar. He, he casually created many myths about himself by disregarding some facts, distorting others, and fabricating the rest. It's really fascinating. <laughs> Hubbard's official biographies describe him as an engineer, a scientist, a naval war hero, an important explorer, and a philosopher. All untrue. He also falsely claimed to be trained in psychoanalysis and in nuclear physics. <laughs> He made up a tale that as a Navy squadron commander during World War II, he sank U-boats and received 27 me medals and awards. That fiction went on to claim imaginary wounds and to describe how, crippled and blind in a military hospital, he combined Eastern philosophy with Freudian analysis and the scientific method to cure himself completely with a fabulous healing discovery called Dianetics. The truth is that Hubbard failed introductory physics 
never got better than a D in mathematics, was put on probation for poor grades at the end of his first year at George Washington University, and flunked out at the end of his second. He never earned a degree in engineering or anything else. During and after the war, Hubbard was hospitalized for a variety of complaints, including arthritis, conjunctivitis, eyesight problems, and a duodenal ulcer. In 1947, he wrote to the Los Angeles Veterans Administration Hospital requesting psychiatric treatment. You understand, this is after he was supposed to have cured himself and become uh, immune by his discovery. His letter states, among other things, I cannot account for nor rise above long periods of moroseness and suicidal inclinations. Far from curing himself with Dianetics, he continued to receive medical disability payments from the Veterans Administration for at least 10 more years. In the early 1950s, for a time, his psychiatric symptoms again became worse, even after the book was published. And he demanded help. He wrote to the FBI, writing that communists, including his estranged wife, had infiltrated his Dianetics movement, and that he had been knocked unconscious, air injected into his heart, and electric shocks administered in an attempt to induce a heart attack. He also complained that communists were extracting scientific secrets from his mind while he slept, <laughs> and went on at some length in his writing to the FBI, uh, berating them for not protecting him from this. Hubbard was a clever, articulate, moderately successful science fiction writer for pulp magazines in the 30s and 40s, and then an incredibly successful promoter. He claimed to have made discoveries about the workings of the human mind that would provide cures for everything, literally, from colds to cancer, from mental illness to radiation sickness. Versions of this claim first appeared in the Explorer's Journal, then in Astounding Science Fiction, and later in 1950 in his book, Dianetics, the Modern Science of Mental Health. By 1952, Hubbard, in an interview, declared that with Dianetics, quote, the blind again see, the lame walk, the ill recover, the insane become sane, and the sane become saner. <laughs> Who could ask for more than that? <clears throat> However, as many of you know, his enterprise was soon in trouble. He was having marital and financial problems. In a widely publicized divorce, his second wife, Sarah, accused Hubbard of subjecting her to torture in his experiments and described him as suffering from paranoid schizophrenia. That diagnosis was made, but I don't think that was the correct diagnosis, as I'll tell you later. Book sales fell off as Dianetics was increasingly criticized as a dangerous oversimplification of human behavior. And Hubbard was faced by legal problems relating to statutes governing the health professions. So guided by cunning legal advice in 1954, Hubbard transformed Dianetics into the Church of Scientology. He later added notions of spirits or thetans to his increasingly fanatic theory, fantastic theory, and incorporated reincarnation to give some classical panache, perhaps, to his science fiction mishmash. Despite a series of scandals and lawsuits, the bizarre mental healing cult has grown into a multi-million dollar, probably billion dollar enterprise, now boasting of 700 centers in 65 countries and 8 million members worldwide, their figures, and openly peddling its non-professional psychotherapy as religious healing. Now, through the years, Hubbard's attitude towards psychiatry professionals ranged from hostile to clinically paranoid. For example, in 1975, he wrote, and I'm not going to quote any of the things that Hannah quoted, the psychiatrist has masters. His principal organization, World Federation of Mental Health, and its members, the National Association of Mental Health, the American Psychiatric Association, and the American Psychological Association, are directly connected to Russia. 
Even the British Broadcasting Corporation has stated that psychiatry and the KGB operate in direct collusion, end quote. Uh, I guess that puts me in a peculiar position since most of the Scientology literature about me, it's said that I'm an agent of the CIA, but I'm also working for the KGB. <laughs> I guess that would make me a double agent, wouldn't it? <laughs> Pretty exciting. <laughs> in 1980, Hubbard added, quotes, spawned by an insanely militaristic government, Psychiatry and psychology find avid support from oppressive and domineering governments. At one time, they were on their way to turning every baby into a future robot for the manipulation of the state and every society into a madhouse of crime and immorality." End quote. As far back as 1966, when Scientology was being heavily criticized in Great Britain, Hubbard had instructed a private investigator to prepare a dossier on every single psychiatrist in England to expose the skeletons in their closets and, quote, to eliminate them all, end quote. Church spokesmen were trained to attack psychiatry as a response to any criticism of Scientology from any source. In the end, Hubbard taught that in their continual reincarnations, psychiatrists or psychs as he called us, were, quote, the sole cause of decline in this universe. They destroyed every great civilization to date and are hard at work on this one, end quote. Well, that might be true of psychology, but certainly not psychiatry. <laughs> My wife's a psychologist, but she's not here. <laughs> so he went on to tell how only the truths of Scientology could save the universe from the evils of psychiatry. I guess that puts us on the dark side, doesn't it? You think, think I could get a job as Darth Vader? <laughs> For many years, Hubbard continued to write voluminously both science fiction stories and endless directives to his followers. However, his health deteriorated and he became increasingly reclusive. The nature and tone of his commands became more erratic. Living on an enormous yacht, the Commodore, as he was called, was available only to chosen members of the Sea Org, mainly followers who had signed long contracts. <laughs> Would you believe billion year long contract? In which they promised to keep returning in subsequent incarnations to continue his work. In hiding from federal investigators, he was never seen alive after 1980 by anyone outside his innermost circle, even within the Sea Org. Uh, they were called the Commodore's Messengers. At the time of his death at age 74 in 1986, the date has been disputed, the Church of Scientology was being controlled mainly by a few messengers. After a major power struggle, one of these, David Miscavige, uh, a glib and um, uh, facile high school dropout, emerged as the new operational leader of the worldwide Scientology enterprise not to be confused with the church, the head of which is, uh, is a Heber Gench, or was, although I understand his position is getting shaky. Oh. Headquarters are, are at Hemet, in California, Hubbard's uh, former hideout, where also are located the E-meter factory, the movie studio, and a prison-like disciplinary camp or rehabilitation project force, RPF, and other facilities. Despite its employment of high-powered talent in public relations and litigation, from 1965 uh, through 73, 
Scientology was banned in parts of Australia, where the Psychological Practices Act made Dianetic treatment a crime, punishable by a large fine and a maximum sentence of two years in jail. The official hearing report called Scientology a serious threat to the community and included that it was, quote, the world's largest organization of unqualified people engaged in the practice of dangerous techniques that masquerade as mental therapy, end quote. But the Scientology, uh, Scientology has always hired excellent lawyers, and with plenty of money and perseverance, in time it was allowed to return. In 1968, Great Britain barred foreign nationals from entering the country to practice Scientology. The ban proved unenforceable and was repealed in 1980, although the ban on Hubbard himself was never lifted. In 1978, French officials convicted Hubbard in absentia and two associates of fraudulent medical practices and fined them about $7,000. However, those decisions were also eventually overturned by higher courts. Presently, the Norwegian Church of Scientology is appealing its loss of a civil suit brought by the son of Marion Lem, who it was proved had been physically and mentally exhausted by the purification rundown and coercively pressured to borrow large sums to pay for 137 hours of audit auditing, which left her feeling worse and later dead of cancer. Judge Vigdis Berg's opinion held that it was, quote, morally improper to bind people to an organization and induce them to pay money in the way it was done to Mrs. Lem. In 1984, Mr. Justice Leahy of the High Court in London declared in a custody case that the, quote, baleful influence of the church posed a grave risk for children and that it would be detrimental for them to be brought up as Scientologists. Because the process of discovery in this case was unusually exhaustive and detailed, Judge Leahy's lengthy opinion deserves a few quotations from it. And I'm quoting, contrary to the assurance of confidentiality, all auditing files are available to Scientology's Intelligence and Enforcement Bureau and are used, if necessary, to control and extort obedience from the person who was audited. If a person seeks to escape from Scientology, his auditing files are taken by the Intelligence Bureau and used, if wished, to pressure him into silence. They are often so used, and uncontroverted evidence of this has been given at this hearing. Scientology must come first before family or friends. Much evidence has been given and not disputed of how it leads to alienation of one spouse from another, of alienation from children and from friends. Scientology, this is a, a quotation from a, another further part of the opinion. Scientology is both immoral and socially obnoxious. In my judgment, says Justice Lady, it is corrupt, sinister, and dangerous. It is corrupt because it is based on lies and deceit and has as its real objective money and power for Mr. Hubbard, his wife, and those close to him at the top. It is sinister because it indulges in infamous practices both to its adherents and uh, who do not toe the line unquestioningly and to those who criticize or oppose it. It is dangerous because it is out to capture people and indoctrinate and brainwash them so that they become the unquestioning captives and tools of the cult, withdrawn from ordinary thought, living, and relationships with others." End quote. That's only eight years ago. In the United States, Scientology's legal battles have been numerous. The Food and Drug Administration was engaged in litigation with them over their use and claims about e-meters, and that led to all kinds of uh, back and forth. But in the end, uh, they got their e-meters back. 